All right. Um, let's turn our hearts and minds towards the Lord. Just one quick prayer. Lord, this is your word. Speak to us now. Well, with us going to Florida, that reminds me of going down south. And so I thought I'd share with you a few things that pretty much um, we call them southernisms. Things that uh, pretty much only southerners understand. Only a true southerner knows the difference between a hissy fit and a conniption fit. And if you don't have them, you pitch a hissy fit and you throw a conniption fit. Big difference. Only a true southerner knows how many fish are in a mess. I caught a mess of fish yesterday. Well, how many is that? Well, you know, you're a southerner, you know that. Only a true southerner can uh, show you any point in the general general direction of yonder. I went over yonder. He caught a big mess of fish. Where is yonder? Well, I don't know. Only a true southerner knows exactly how long directly is. Going to town, I'll be back directly. Only a true southerner knows that fixin' can be a noun, a verb, or an adverb. Only true southerners never refer to one person as y'all. Y'all is full. And true southerners know that grits come from corn and they know how to eat. Finally, only a true southerner knows that you don't yell and scream obscenities at little old ladies that are driving 30 miles an hour down the highway. You just say, oh, bless our heart. You know, we grew up in different parts of the country with all types of uh, traditions and beliefs and sayings and all these types of things. And, and as we grow up, the way we are raised makes a lot of difference in what we believe and even how we live our lives. All these traditions and beliefs make a difference. And you speak certain ways and you mean certain things. And if you go down south, uh, you know, you're going to visit down there. Come see me. I'll help you with some of the southern phrases so you can understand them a little bit better. But sometimes you even say things here. Sometimes I go, why are you talking about It's like you have little, little things like people say, well, um, they, they say a cross. You say a cross instead of a cross. There's no T on the end of it. But Nebraskans say, yeah, I went looking out across the lawn out there. It's like, you know, if you have your little strange things, we have our little strange things. And everybody has their you know, different things we say and different way we talk, talk. But all the things we learn as we grow up determine the, the way we live and they determine how we live our lives and how we build our lives. And as believers in Jesus Christ, we're encouraged in the scriptures to primarily build our lives Lord and Peter in this book, and we're looking at First Peter, the passage we come to today, he's encouraging us to understand who Jesus Christ is and uses the metaphor of a cornerstone and to build our lives upon Jesus as the cornerstone. And our text is in uh, First Peter chapter 2, we're looking at verses 4 through 8. So if you'd like to turn there, I'm going to read through this passage and then we'll Go through and uh, examine a little closer what Peter is saying, what this means for us. So, First uh, Peter chapter two, verse four: As you come to Him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to Him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in the Scriptures it says, "See, I lay in Zion." a chosen and precious cornerstone. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, that, who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. 
Peter begins here using this uh, analogy, this metaphor of the cornerstone, of a, a living stone. And he uses it. The, the Bible is full of metaphors and examples and illustrations. And we understand Jesus in, in different ways. He's the Lamb of God, the, the Messiah. There's different names given to him, but a lot of them are metaphors. He uses them. The cornerstone is a metaphor. Jesus is not literally a stone, but it's, it's a way to understand who he is and what he has done and what he is doing. And so we take this uh, this cornerstone illustration. I'm going to, I think most of you kind of understand some of this, but we're going to move forward and let's see, do we have, let's see, do we have my, hmm, what's the next song? Okay, maybe it's not up yet. Okay. Um, did it get added on? Oh, there it is. Okay. Cool. Yep, we got it. All right. So there's several ways cornerstones are, are looked at. This, if you look at this picture, some people call this middle one a cornerstone. It's also called a keystone. When you have an arch, and you've got that one stone in the middle that kind of keeps it from falling, some people refer that to as a cornerstone or a keystone. Another way to look at, some people call this a cornerstone. When you have a stone out there that has a name on it or like Right out here on our building, maybe you've never noticed it, has the name of the church, and when this, when we got into this building, 1995, there's a Bible verse, and, and some people call this a cornerstone. It kind of marks the building, and we call it a cornerstone. But these are some of the modern terms of cornerstone. The way the cornerstone in Jesus' day, in ancient times, is quite different, you may know this. The cornerstone, when they built a building, they made them, you know, out of stone, a lot of them were made out of stone, and you had to lay, you know, a foundation of stone, and you usually had cornerstones. If it was a square or a rectangular building, you had four stones at the corner, but there was one chief stone, and it was called a cornerstone. And everything was lined up with that one stone. This would be your cornerstone down here. And everything was lined up with that. And so if it was not square and out of line, then eventually, you know, maybe your first row of stones wouldn't be would you just a little bit off, but you know how that goes. You get it off a little plum, and the longer it gets off, the worse it gets as the building gets bigger. So it had to be absolutely perfect. That was the cornerstone. That's how the building was built. It started with this first primary stone. Again, you may have some other stones, but they were, it was called the chief cornerstone. And this is the one that had to be absolutely perfect. Here's another picture of kind of how a cornerstone might look. Here's kind of a modern day building. Now, this building may actually have a foundation, we don't know, but it'd be like this stone right here. This this stone would be your chief cornerstone. It would go down first, and then everything else was built on that stone. That was the concept of the cornerstone. And now, Peter refers to Jesus as the, as a living stone, and then he refers to him as the cornerstone. So it's a, we understand it to be a metaphor that he's Jesus is not literally a rock. It's a metaphor. He, he's a stone, and, but he's the cornerstone. He's the foundation. He's the number one stone. He's the one on which everything else is measured by and built upon. And so it's, that's the idea behind the cornerstone. And so Jesus here, Peter says, he is chosen and precious. We understand he was chosen before the world was ever created, before mankind was ever created. He was chosen by God be the savior of the world, but also to be the cornerstone. Before man was created, Jesus was already chosen. This was the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all decided together that Jesus would be the one. He would come to be the savior. He would come to be the cornerstone of his church. And so this was predetermined. And he says, he is precious, very precious. God, this wasn't some just haphazard thing that God said, well, you know, let's flip the coin and see who's going to do this. You know, he was God's precious and one and only son that he sent to the world to be this, this cornerstone for his church. And so this was who Jesus came. And Father demonstrates his love for us in that he sent his son to do that. And he says, he says here, all who put their trust in him will never be put to shame. He's, he's the cornerstone in those who trust in him, who trust in what he did, who he is, his death, his 
barrel in the resurrection for you. Those who put their trust in will never be put to shame. You know, sometimes uh, people like to shame other people. Especially when somebody in child disobeys, we sometimes like to say, shame on you. We like, to, we like to point our fingers and sometimes we like to shame other people or Pretty, pretty prevalent now. You get on the inter internet, and people are always shaming somebody else for this or that or the other. But those who put their trust in Jesus will never be put to shame. He's never going to put you to shame. Doesn't mean you won't ever sin. But once you put your trust in Him, you are secure in Him. There'll never be any more shame because He's already paid for all the sin. He's taking care of all your sin problems. Never be put to shame. Those who trust in Jesus and his sins for He also talks about this stone, this cornerstone, was rejected. The builders rejected him. Here I think he's referring to the nation of Israel. Jesus came as the Messiah. He came as the Savior of his people. And the religious leaders, by and large, rejected him. They did not receive him. And from the very beginning of his ministry, they got angry with him. They challenged him. And they, they, they started, they began to plot against him. And they would, they would try to catch him in his words. And they would try to trick him. And they would, they, eventually they started putting plans together. How can we take custody of him and actually kill him? They didn't begin to plan to kill him. They rejected him. He says the builders, those who were in charge of the nation, those who were the ones who were the spiritual leaders, those who were responsible for the nation itself, its spiritual condition, rejected the one who was the one who was the poor. They rejected the Messiah. And so the cap, this, this one they rejected has become, the NIV says capstone, and the idea here is the chief cornerstone. He became the number one cornerstone, the primary cornerstone. He became the, the foundation. And it's, if you look at it, it's you know, like a building. At the building today, we don't use cornerstones, but we lay a foundation, a concrete foundation. We lay the foundation, and this is what Jesus is. He is that foundation. And so he was rejected, he was crucified, but when he became the cornerstone, he said, I think this is a reference to his resurrection. He was rejected and crucified, but he ultimately became the cornerstone. He became the one who God would build. His church, and so this is what Peter is talking about here with, with this cornerstone. And so, people who come to Jesus have a choice they will either accept him or reject him. You can accept who he is, you can accept what he did for you, you can accept the fact that you can't save yourself, that only Jesus can save you, and you can accept him and receive him, or you can say, That's okay, I'll, I'll do it on my own. People throughout the world will either accept him or reject him. Jesus' name has gone throughout the world. Yes, there may be some people somewhere that have never heard of him, but his name has gone pretty much throughout all the world. The gospel is out there, and you can accept him or reject him. You can accept him and become his and never be put to shame, or you can reject him and face the judgment of death. That's just, that's just the heart. There will be condemnation, there will be judgment for all who reject the of Jesus Christ. And some will reject him. God knew that some would reject. Not that he wants people to reject him. He didn't predetermine that you would reject him, but he offers him to all people. And some will receive and some will reject. And those who receive him are given the gift of everlasting life. So who are you building your life on? There was a gentleman from Holland, a young man by the name of Alexander Peter Kirk. And he met a young lady online, a Chinese, young Chinese lady from China, and they begin to communicate online. And, and in their online communications, he, he just fell in love. He fell head over heels. And, and they were so far apart, and he wanted to see her so badly. And so uh, this young man, Alexander, decided he was going to go to China to see her. So he got his passport, he got his visa, he purchased his plane tickets, and he was going to fly the 5,000 miles to go to China, 
visit this young lady because he had fallen head over heels. So he got ready, he sent her his itinerary and told her when he would be there and asked her to meet him at the airport. He made the trip, he flew in, he got to the airport and there was she wasn't there. But convinced that she would soon come, convinced that he but she felt the same as he did that she would be there and he waited. He waited. And a day went by and she didn't come. Another day went by and she didn't come. He waited, believing that she would come. Ten days later, he had become so distressed and so distraught, they had to take him to the hospital. And she never showed up. Waiting and waiting, believing that this one would be the answer. The news agency in China picked up on this and finally found the young lady and she said this. She said, I never really thought that he would make the trip. I thought he would go. I know, sad story. But what are you hoping in? What are you building your life on? You see, sometimes we put our primary hope for our lives in other people. And sometimes that pays off. And sometimes. When our hope is in people and in things, sooner or later, we know these disappointments. Peter is saying here, Jesus is the cornerstone. Build your life on Him. Build your life on Christ. And so, his encouragement here is to build your life on Jesus, the cornerstone. Notice what he says here. He said, you also like living stones. Jesus is like a living stone. Again, that's a metaphor. You are like living stones too. You're like a stone. Now that you've come to Christ, you're like a living stone. And you are built into a spiritual house to a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Two kind of metaphors here that, that Peter builds on. One is the spiritual house, kind of like the temple. The spiritual house where the Spirit of God dwells. And that, that illustration is used in several places in Scripture where the church is like a house or it's like a building. And here he says, your living stones built into a spiritual house and also into a holy priesthood. So it's like we're the temple and the priesthood. We'll focus more on the priesthood next week, but we're focusing on this spiritual house that you and I are part of. We make up this spiritual house through Jesus Christ. We're living stones through this, this spiritual house that he's building. And so, therefore, the encouragement he is saying is, look, this is who you are. So build your house, build your life on this stone, on this cornerstone, this Jesus Christ. You can build your life on a lot of things. You can build your life based on family. And family's a good thing. Family's a wonderful thing. As most of you know, family doesn't always work out. Sometimes we have struggles with family. Sometimes family members are at odds with one another. Sometimes families just don't get along. Sometimes they get along perfectly. Sometimes not. You can build your life on your career. But most of us have lived long enough to know that careers can change, and especially in the middle of this COVID, things have changed. People's careers, suddenly, many of them are falling apart. People are having to find new work. You can build your life on the career, but in the later, suddenly they fall apart too. You can build your life on that loved one, that husband, that wife, the one who you think is the person for you. And that may work out perfect. It may be wonderful. If you've been married long enough, you know. <laughs> there are disappointments that come with that too, right? <laughs> Doesn't mean it's not perfect, but then sometimes that even falls apart. We build our life on so many things. We build our life, some people on entertainment. Everything is about being entertained. You can't ever be entertained enough. There's not enough entertainment to keep you entertained. All these things that people build their lives on, sooner or later, they fall apart. You can build your life on yourself. 
but you'll disappoint yourself. The only sure thing that you can build our lives on is the Lord Jesus Christ. To build your life on Christ. A few things about what does that mean? What does that look like? I think it begins with knowing and having confidence in the gospel. Do you understand the gospel clearly? I don't think many people in our country understand the gospel clearly. The gospel of Jesus Christ. We call a lot of things the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the message, clearly, of his death, his shed blood, and his resurrection. And understanding that is the only way of salvation. For any human being that's coming through Jesus Christ and what he did for us. That all of our sins are paid for. Not just a little bit of them, and you've got to pay for the rest. And that it's salvation by grace through faith plus nothing. So many people want to add a list of works to the gospel. Salvation by grace through faith plus all this other stuff you need to do. We hear this all the time. That's not the gospel. Many times I've said yes, we're all to good work. That follows salvation. And understanding the gospel and having confidence in the gospel. You have enough confidence in the gospel to share it with someone. You have enough confidence to believe that this message truly will save a person's soul. Or is it just a religious thing we believe? You have enough confidence to know that you are eternally saved in Jesus Christ and he will never fail. You have enough confidence in the gospel and what Jesus Christ did. That's where building our life begins on that right there. If you don't understand the gospel clearly and you don't have confidence in it, it's very difficult to build your life. It's very difficult to build a, a building on a crumbling foundation or something you're not sure about. You go and there's this foundation that's got huge cracks all in it. You go, well, maybe we don't want to build a house on it. Back in Mississippi, where we lived in, in uh, near Amory, Mississippi, the, the, the ground there was very, was a very clay type ground. And when it would get dry in the summer, you get these huge cracks in the ground. They would, you get huge cracks like this all over the place. And when you built a house on this, you put a foundation on that, it would always crack. And sometimes really uh, significantly such that your doors would be on a line. Like that. So they learned how to build a foundation on it. You may have heard of it. It's called a floating foundation. You can take the where, the where the house is supposed to sit and you dig out all the dirt. You dig it all out, about two to three feet deep. You go in there and you set forms and you put footings all the way around. And once, that's, once your concrete footings are set, then you backfill it with gravel. And then you pour your foundation. And it's called a floating foundation. And it, it wasn't absolute, but it helped, it helped the foundation to, to not crack. At least not so bad anyway. But if you have a cracked foundation, you don't want to build a house on it. And if you're not sure of the foundation, you wouldn't build a house. Are you sure of the foundation? Are you sure you just want to build? You have confidence in that. That's how you do it. First thing you need to do to build your life. And we place our hope. We sing that in some of our songs. All our hope is in you. Is it? Is all our hope in Christ? Is, is your primary hope in Christ? Yeah, it's all right to hope for things in this world and hope for a better life and a better family and a better job or whatever. But as we said, those things can fail you. Is your ultimate hope in Christ and in Christ alone? That's what it means to build your life upon Christ. You fall on him, or do you? Uh, do you try to get by and do everything on your own until finally you go, "Wow, I just can't, I just can't fix this one, Jesus." So how about helping? You? That's my tendency. It's like, yeah, I want to do it. I want to be independent, and I want to do it myself. And then when I get in that part, that place where I just can't figure it out, okay, how about your help, Jesus? Yeah, that's my tendency. Did you call on him for everything? Did you start when you're making plans? When you're going to do things, do you start with Jesus or do you start with you? The tendency of human beings is to start with me. 
It also means to speak his name with reverence and confidence without shame. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes. Speaking the name of Jesus can get you in trouble these days. It's bad enough to call yourself a Christian. That doesn't go over real well. If you speak the name of Jesus Christ, people don't like that very much. You can believe any God you want to in America. Just don't talk about Jesus. Just don't say his name. Don't pray in his name. It's okay if you believe in him, but don't talk about it. And don't tell me about it. That's the culture we're coming in in this country. Because there is a, I think there's a, in this world, there's an evil that is suppressing the gospel message. We as believers, you have to be willing to speak his name. Don't be ashamed of his name. Don't be arrogant. Don't be proud. But speak his name with confidence. Know that he is your Lord and Savior. Give honor and glory to him. In the difficult times, in the difficult times, you trust him completely. In the difficult time we're going through in America, and I see all kind of stuff that just gets me so upset. I could, I mean, I just get boiling over the stuff I see in here. I get frustrated. I get angry with it. And I want to fix it. How much do I trust Jesus? Sometimes not very much. But I, want to, I want to tell those people what because I know. Right? How much do we truly trust them to fix what's going on? Or trust that even if it doesn't get fixed, he's still in control. He's still in control. And if I'm living for his purposes and his glory. You see, quite often I live for my purposes. I live for Kind of adds into Jesus' purposes. Just the focus of my life, the primary focus, living for His purposes and His glory. And these are the things that I've listed here. I think very important to build your life on Christ. Because I'm like the rest of you. It's easy. I can do all my life and do all kinds of things. And sometimes I do. And those things produce me to let you down. You are living stones. You have been placed. In Christ, because you're a living stone, don't jump off the wall. <laughs> Continue to build your life in Christ. And I think this is what he was encouraging us here. In Portland, Oregon, at the corner of Morris and 7th Street, a lady by the no name of Nicole Helton had a huge tree, a huge chestnut tree, and she decided in 2013 that uh, for whatever reason, she was going to, she had some wishes, some things she wanted, and she decided she was going to write her wishes on, on a little note and hang them from her tree, and she did that, and she left for a week on vacation, and when she came back, there were literally hundreds of notes all over the street where people had written their wishes and placed them in the street, and so she got this great idea. And she began to advertise it, and she put a little uh, uh, clipboard out there and gave instructions and some little notes. She said, you know, write a wish, something you wish for, for some family member or for yourself or whoever. Write the wish and hang it on the tree. And this thing began to catch on, and soon there were just little notes hanging all over the street, people writing their wishes. And, and it, it became a big thing. Everyone would come and write their wish and hope that these things would come true. If they took their wish, wrote it on a note, and stuck it to this tree, that maybe it would come true. Kind of like throwing the penny in the wishing well, right? And so everyone began to focus on that, and, and they, she got so excited, you know, about putting these things. People would wish for all kinds of things. They would wish for other people. They would wish for themselves. They would wish nice things. And they just continued to post these notes over and over. She said one time, sometimes the notes would get blown off, and we understood that uh, this was a sign that that wish was going to get fulfilled. It didn't need to be on the tree anymore. And so we, we put our hope and wishes. How much hope do you put in your wishes? I wish for this, I wish for that, I wish for lots of things. How much confidence are we placing in that? How much hope are we 
placing them in these wishes that may or may not be true. He is encouraging us to continue to build the life on the Lord, not only by the wishes. The last point here I want to make is that not only do we build our individual lives on the Lord, but we need to build His church on Jesus the Promise. You see, sometimes we can build our lives, individual lives, on the cornerstone, but the church is built on something else. So I think the emphasis here is that we should build life on the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul talks about this idea. In verse 14, he's talking about Jesus who came to bring unity among the Gentiles and the Jews. As you know, the Jews consider themselves superior to anybody else who was not a Jew, and those anybody who was not a Jew was a Gentile. And so there was this division. And the Jews didn't like the Gentiles very much, and most Gentiles didn't like the Jews. Very much. So Jesus, Peter, uh, Paul talks about how he came to bring peace. In verse 14, he says, speaking of Jesus, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in his body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he was put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through them, him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. So basically he said, Jesus came to bring peace. He came to bring people who were at odds with one another together into one body. He says one new man, to one new thing. He's talking about the church, the body of Christ. Those who maybe were at odds with one another, now, another cow, and now can come together in one new entity. He goes on to say, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people, members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Again, the analogy of a building here. God is, Jesus is bringing us together. We are the pieces. We are the parts of the body. We are parts of the building. Just like a building cannot be built upon one or two two befores or a handful of two befores. You need a whole stack of them to build the walls and then you have to have your trusses and all these. Everything is interdependent. Every part of the building is important. Even the interior parts of the building are important. The purpose of the whole building. Suppose you built a house and it was a very nice house. I know when they build them houses down in Florida now, they try to build extra strength in them to try to withstand the hurricanes. And so you build this hurricane resistant house or tornado resistant house. It's very strong. It's very firm. It's built for you. And the first day you go in and there's no plumbing. And there's no lights. It's firm. It's good. It's not going to get blown away. It's going to be there a long time. But what good is it? Every part of the building is important. If you don't have any plumbing, you're going to have to get you some outdoor plumbing. Most of us wouldn't be too good with that. Every part of the building is important. And this is the idea. We are being built up into a spiritual house. And every single part of the building is important and is crucial. Paul talks about this when he talks about spiritual gifts. Everyone has a spiritual gift. Every spiritual gift works together. We're to work together as one unit for the glory of Christ. We're interconnected. Every person is interconnected in the body of Christ. And yes, there may be some people in the body that you like better than others. That's just human nature. We're all connected in Christ. And every person is important. Every part is important. And the idea is that we are building together. We're unified together, building this thing called the church of Jesus Christ. 
And everybody has a part in it. Every Christian, every believer has the part of building the body of Christ. And it starts with the local church. Building the body. And this is what he's talking about here. We are built together until unto a spiritual household. Paul says, this is the place where the Spirit of God dwells in this spiritual household. He dwells within us individually. He dwells within us corporately. That's what a temple is. It's where the Spirit of God dwells. You are the temple of God. And we are building together. And so there's things that we must do to bring this church together. So what are the things that we do to build the church upon the Lord? Well, it seems... Some of these things may seem obvious, but you must proclaim the gospel clearly. If you're not proclaiming the gospel, you're not a church. If Jesus isn't being preached, if the message of salvation isn't preached, at least at some times, you're not really a church. If the church is about Jesus, right? And the gospel must be proclaimed clearly. Proclaimed. Salvation by grace through faith. We must proclaim that message. And so to, to build the church of Jesus Christ, it starts there. We can't really build a church with lost people. Do we want lost people coming up to you? We want, we want them to come in the doors and hear the gospel. But you can't really build your church on people that don't know Christ. You have to proclaim that message. That's how you build a church. It's by proclaiming the gospel. Our hope, this is our individual hope, our hope as a body must be in Christ. Your hope can't be in me or the next preacher that comes along. It can't be in your worship team. It can't be in your leadership team. It can't be in fire up ministry. It can't be in any of these things. Our hope can't be in people. Our hope has to be in Christ. Like a church body. What are we hoping for? We're hoping that Christ be glorified in us. And so this is in our individual lives. Our hope must be in Christ. We must pray regularly and often for the church. Our church and the church as a whole. And I know many of you do. But continue to pray for this church and the community. For its leaders. All that we can do. We cannot function without prayer. That's the essential value. We're not a praying church, we're not a church. You don't preach the gospel in that church, you don't pray in that church. We're just, we're just a Christian organization. And some people can create Christian organizations, but they may not be church. Worship must be focused on Jesus if you do a really good job of that. You didn't have to be mentioned in every single song, but. Uh, the ultimate focus must be on Him and what He's done for us. And, and yes, we sing praises about God the Father and the Holy Spirit, absolutely. But there has to be some focus somewhere on Christ Himself. It's not just some generic song. We have to have some of us on Christian focus. And we do a great job of that here. I'm just saying that's part of building our church on Christ. We, I wrote it this way. We must work hard to be unified for his purpose. Unity is not easy. We all have different opinions. If I did an opinion poll here right now and ask you what's the number one most important thing that we must do, let's see how many people we got here. So we, got 40, we probably have 40 different opinions. And that's fine. Opinions are opinions. They're your opinions. But how do we bring 40 different opinions together in the community? It's hard. You have to work at it. You have to listen. You have to discuss. You have to be willing to say, well, maybe I was wrong. You have to, you have to know why we're doing what we're doing. Unity just is not easy because we're human beings, because we're simple human beings. Unity is. The United States of America is not is not very united. And the church can be the same way if you're doing this part. And finally, to serve him. 
church is not here to serve you, it's for you to serve you. Yes, I hope you do get served. But the primary purpose is not for the church to serve you. The primary purpose is for the church to serve him. It's not for you to serve me. It's for you to serve you. And vice versa. You're not here just to, yes, I hope you are, hope you are served well today. But the ultimate focus for our individual lives is that we're to serve him. And the church is here for us to serve him. We have for him to serve us. Here's a story you probably will not hear on the news or on the internet because it will probably get swelled. But in the summer of 2016, in Barnesville, Georgia, on the campus of Gordon State College, uh, some people began to complain about a tent being pitched on the college campus. And so police officers were called, and they came out, and they came to this tent, and uh, two white police officers came and found a young black teenager, 19 years old, camped out in this tent. And so they just came to ask him, and you know, what was going on, and why was he there? Come to find out, he was enrolled in college. But he lived more than 50 miles away, and the only way he could get to school was to ride his brother's little bicycle for six hours, on well, these little bicycles, he rode a bicycle six hours to get to the campus. He registered for school, but he had no money for dorm or for living anywhere. And so he pitched the tent and he was living in this tent. And he would he would go to class, but then he would take his bicycle and ride around town. He tried to find a job. And he doesn't have any luck right now, but this is all he could do. As they talked to him, they found out this, this young man was committed. To going to college to get in his education he ultimately wanted to become a doctor but he was starting here and he was actually in his second year but he, he had no funds uh, so he was trying to you know for living and he was just living in his tent so the two police officers opened up their wallet and gave him everything they had right there in their wallet they took him to the local motel and one paid for one night one paid for the next night then one of the officers went home and posted this on facebook and the city of Barnesville responded immediately. People began, they began to send money began to come in, food, clothing, all types of things began to come in for this young man so that he could have a place to live. Someone bought him a brand new bicycle so he could ride around on. And he eventually got enough to move him into an apartment and all the things he needed for his apartment and had clothes and started providing for this young man so he could go to college. And then, then somebody had the idea to start a GoFundMe page. So they started a GoFundMe page. And they raised $184,000 for this young man's education so he could go to college and go to medical school. It was all given to him. Started by two police officers. Because you're not going to hear that on the next one. Beside the point, <laughs> it's those looking out for other people. How much was poured in to the lives of this, this life of this one young man who needed help? He was serious. He wanted to do something. He wanted to do something good, but he didn't have the means to do so. And people stepped up for him. You, the church, need to step up and just need those things because we're here to serve. We're here to serve each other. We're here to serve our community. And those are wonderful stories we hear in our community. We need to be hearing stories like this out of our churches. And they are. They're out there. We are here, here for the purpose of a greater, a greater purpose, a greater goal than just our individual goal. That is what the church is for. So, say to you, Jesus is our cornerstone. Jesus is our chief cornerstone. And for building your life on Jesus. And let us build that church in Jesus. We'll pray. Father, thank you for what you've done for us, people. Jesus, thank you that you are our cornerstone. We can build our life upon you and know and have confidence in who you are and what you've done, that you love us and have our best purpose at stake. And we can truly pour our lives into you, even though sometimes the life around us 
this world around us seems to be difficult. It seems to be struggling. And we get upset, Lord. We need to come back to the center and know that you can build our lives with and have confidence and assurance that you will use us here in this world and in this community and in this church. We thank you for that. May we truly remember that you are our cornerstone and you can build our lives.